Rebel Force Radio presents. Hello, what have we here? Fangirls going rogue. I met her in a Jedi chat room. Star Wars news, topics, and conversation from the female point of view. I like the sound of that. This is Fangirls going rogue. So we are on episode 19, you guys, and I don't even know what to do with myself because we are almost at episode 20, and it's amazing. There's been a lot of stuff going on. Star Wars Weekend started. Star Wars Infinity's coming out. We've got pirates in Star Wars, Hispanic actors in Rogue One. What? Okay, the galaxy is exploding. I don't know how you guys feel about that, but it is. So to help me talk about the exploding galaxy of awesome Star Wars are my amazing co-hosts. Oh, by the way, this is fangirls going rogue in case you didn't know but you already pushed play so you should know so this is trisha Barr. how are you i'm head exploding as well <laughs> vanity fair hence my very <laughs> random crazy intro i feel like we're that's the best way to intro the show <laughs> we're supposed to be like recovering from celebration but i feel like they just keep maybe we're mainlining it at this point <laughs> i think from now on this is what it's going to be like and to help us talk about all of the crazy Sarah Woloski is here. How are you? Hey, everyone. I am excited as well. Star Wars just keeps on rolling out. I mean, I was super excited by that uh, Star Wars Infinity news. Like, Disney Infinity 3.0 with these awesome, super cute Star Wars characters. Oh, my gosh. And Clone Wars characters, guys. We have a special guest host with us who we've been trying to have back on the show. But, you know, she's in school and school comes first and blah, 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 blah. (laughs) Bethany Blanton from the Star Wars Report. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well and excited to be on the show. What a way to celebrate May the 4th, Revenge of the 5th, Revenge of the 6th. We get Vanity Fair, we get covers, we get Gwendolyn Christie as a chrome trooper, not a clone trooper, maybe a chrome clone trooper. Now I'm going to really tongue tie everybody. So what was everybody's favorite? Was it Gwendolyn Christie's character, Lupita, or just... That pilot. My favorite part of the Vanity Fair stuff, it wasn't even a picture. It was just the announcement that um, Lupita Nyong'o was playing a pirate. And then that concept art of that she has her own freaking castle. She's got to throw a better party than Jabba any day. So <laughs> I don't know. I've got this weird pirate thing going on. For me, it, it actually, it definitely was the Chrome Trooper. And Part of it is I am a fan of Christy, uh, especially since Game of Thrones. And so I I just can't wait to see her play some type of character like that. Just a really awesome character. And uh, I I do kind of go for the whole trooper thing to some degree. So it's really cool to have a female trooper. Well, currently my iPhone background is the cover. So you have Han Solo and Chewie and, uh, goodness, uh, Padme, not Padme. Ray. Ray. Thank you. Ray. That's my current iPhone cover, but I also loved the photo with John Williams in it, along with J.J. Abrams and Kathleen Kennedy and Lawrence Kasdan, just to see all those four minds in a room together. Like, wow, mind blown. I want to see this movie so bad. My favorite that, was, that was J.J. Good. Abrams freaking out about showing John Williams his Star Wars mm-hmm. movie. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so, yes. like, <laughs> like, oh, I'm showing John Williams my Star Wars. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm showing John Williams my Star Wars movie. Now, let me think about this sentence for a minute. Whoa. <laughs> well, you know what I really like about Gwendolyn Christie's image of her as the Chrome Trooper is that she looks like she could be a guy under there like they didn't make her look feminine they didn't make her look petite or small or you know make the armor look you know like there's a girl under there and i really like that that was one thing that i was like you go star wars well she's what six she's over six feet tall right you know but i mean they could have made her look slender or you know how some of the girls that have stormtrooper outfits and like the sexy stormtrooper outfits, oh, you know right, how yeah. it looks in the front, like with the chest piece and everything. Yes. and yeah. they didn't do that, and I and I appreciated that, so I was like, yay. Well, I'm I'm getting a very uh, medieval kind of King Arthur vibe from the castle and sort of the chrome. It gives you like the knights and shining armor, except obviously a little more polished than you know a knight would be. And you know they had the castle and the fire, and then the pirates. I don't know. I just. 
you know, all that was I was going King Arthur. That was where my brain went with it. And when then we had obviously the the controversial broadsword, triple bladed, whatever it is, the lightsaber of Kylo Ren. Who and I thought that image looked way better in print than it did digitally. I don't know why he looked like like he was like too skinny or something and when you looked at it online and then when I got the print version I was like okay it doesn't look as kind of funky as it d- does online so <laughs> the one with him and the snowtroopers yes yeah you know like that image he does look a little bit odd but um the snowtroopers look so cool like they got a redesign too which is pretty neat and then w- there's just like been this bunch of interviews at Vanity Fair obviously he got to talk to everybody a bunch while he was on the set and then you know we got Kasdan talking about making the movie and talking about just the things that he remembers about writing the you know the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi and then you know what he brings out of Star Wars just the you know the familial relationship parent uh, child relationship and then we got an interview with uh, Michael Kaplan, the costume designer today. So a little short one, but he obviously talked a little bit about what the clone or the, the stormtroopers. See, now I'm all clone trooper, clone trooper. <laughs> the stormtrooper design was inspired by the uh, look of apples, mm. you know, the, the kind of more sleeker look. So everybody who <laughs> the has... The Apple company, a, not the apples you yes, eat. The Apple, yes, the Apple company. <laughs> so everybody who has an iPhone or iPod, you can thank that, that wonderful... Uh, Stormtrooper look, um, it's an ode to apparently Apple. So they are the Empire, maybe. Did you guys see the interview with Daisy Ridley and Kathleen Kennedy? The one on Kotaku? Yes. Well, they Uh, went before this even went out. They were over in Japan on April 30th doing press, which I think is really interesting that they went overseas and the interviews are literally now yeah. just really surfacing. Basically, Daisy Ridley is asked to describe her character and she oh, yeah. does <laughs> and she <laughs> honestly comes out and she is she does not mean this intentionally, but she says, I'm not sure how much I can say. I guess because I've said that I'm solitary, that's how I begin. That is probably a big clue as to what um <laughs> what it is. And the interviewer gives her this look, I, I think, because she kind of freezes. And then Kathleen Kennedy kind of laughs nervously and Daisy backpedals ridiculously. It's it's so funny. But in that moment, it, it, it clicked to her that when she said solitary, what all fans would immediately think about. And I, I am very intrigued. I'm very intrigued. That was Star Wars punny. It was Star Wars punny. Come on. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think I think it's that same interview where they asked if, about Boba Fett coming back. And then also they asked about Ewok reappearances. And Kathleen Kennedy said that Boba Fett is a high priority for them. But it's harder for them to see how the Ewoks could return. And I was like, aw. I don't see how that's hard. They fly, can fly an X-Wing. This is not a hard thing. <laughs> put them in the in the orange jumpsuit and make them part of the resistance. Yeah. You better put them in the chrome trooper outfit and make them part of the Empire. Just Ewoks stack are them on top of too. each other. You have them stand on each other's shoulders until they're six foot tall. The coolest thing was Kathleen Kennedy actually talking about uh, that grown men were afraid of Daisy Ridley with her bojitsu skills, which is a form of staff fighting. Uh, and we will provide links in the show notes. But I've been talking for since May of last year about Chloe Bruce, who was rumored to be Daisy Ridley's stunt uh, double and had video of her staff fighting and da- Chloe Bruce and Daisy really took a picture at the cast party and it seems like Daisy might be able to hold her own with uh, according to Kathleen Kennedy with that staff so I'm excited to hear that news but guys I don't know I mean Vanity Fair was cool and all but I'm sorry <laughs> Priorities. but I'm sorry Disney Infinity 3.0 is like Oh, my God, it's mind-blowing, and I'm so excited. I'm so excited about it that I had finished collecting the entire collection of Disney Infinity 1.0, figures and power discs and everything, and I stopped when 2.0 came out, and I was like, I'll just wait. They made the announcement for 3.0 that it's coming out in the fall, which means I am shelling out money to get (laughs) 2.0 before it disappears off the shelf. So (laughs) I now have... 
Like, I think I've gotten like 10 of the figures. I'm working on power discs. So Disney Infinity 3.0 is going to have Star Wars in it finally. And the coolest part about this is that the starter pack set is actually with Clone Wars characters. Clone Wars Anakin and Clone Wars Ahsoka. And the playset piece is actually called The Twilight of the Republic. And I was just like, wow, they did Clone Wars. Well, I found an interview that was done with the makers of Disney Infinity Avalanche Software. And the reason that they chose to do Clone Wars was because as they assessed who the game is for, they and they did all of their market research and all that stuff, they found that the majority of the kids identify with the Clone Wars. So they decided to use it. And I was just like, wow. I know. You must be following GameInformer.com. I might be, because they have every piece of news about this. They do, yeah. Each day in May, they're releasing like a new video or a new interview um, about the the game, and it's super interesting. Like, I I loved the interview they did that was about, you know, the, the... the making of the characters themselves, like the design of them. It it was so intriguing and how the Clone Wars characters are actually very close to the, to the design they actually chose. So that it was pretty easy to translate Ahsoka and Anakin and even Yoda to, to the design of the characters, except for Yoda himself, they were having trouble, like what size to make him (laughs) as compared to some of the other characters. So yeah, I'm super excited for this too. And I am not a big gamer at all, but I, you know, I choose my games very wisely and I, I jumped in Disney 2.0 when the Marvel characters came out. So my favorite character is Thor. I love his hammer. (laughs) <laughs> and so now I'm just excited. I'm going to have to collect all of the Star Wars characters because, wow. So I'm not a big gamer at all. Is You you actually play a game, but you collect things along with this. Is that right? Am I understanding? Yeah, and, um, it basically fuels two of my obsessions, which means that <laughs> um, it basically takes over my life. So the idea behind it is there's the game playing part and then there's the collecting part of it. So if you were the collector, you get all the figures and then there's the power discs, which you can actually put the round ones you can put underneath your character to give them more abilities. Or there's discs that are hexagons that actually go into what's called the toy box part of this game, which is kind of like a Minecraft sort of thing where you just build your own world and you can get different skies or terrain so like for 2.0 you can have iron man um like the view for the sky through the iron man helmet and then the iron man ground you can have the simba pride lands i accidentally the other day put the it's a small world ones on there and (laughs) had it's a small world sky and ground and the song playing nonstop. Oh, and wow. Yeah, that's what happens when you put both of the It's a Small World ones on there and you transform it. Uh, don't do it. You you can also have Rapunzel's floating lanterns. Yes, you can. There's her, there's, there's her sky and her ground. Yeah, it's really cool. There's so much to do, partially the infinity part of it. I mean, you know, for creative kids, this is kind of like perfect yeah i have not even figured out all that you can do yet and i've had the game for about a month and a half i think but just to make yourselves aware you can only play with the characters that you actually buy so so like i've bought tinkerbell and rapunzel and thor you know like those are the characters i pretty much play with all the time another thing that came out is that um we could quite possibly have a hispanic actor in Rogue One. And I know we probably have, have had Hispanic what, actors what? before. Yeah, Diego Luna. Yeah. Is being I, I mean, I'm pretty excited about this, as you can tell, because I just started talking like, woo! <laughs> well, right. that's when you go for go it. On. No, go for it. You probably know more about it than I do. Go for it. Well, uh, it's, it's interesting because at Celebration, they were so... Like, you could tell that they knew they had to have panels about Rogue One, but they have very little information that they were ready to release. And so it's, for me, it's, I just think it's really cool to have a Hispanic actor who will be like a highlighted character. Like you were saying, yeah, there have probably been some sort of Hispanic actors or maybe uh, voice actors or, or, you know, people in the background of the movies and stuff, but 
there haven't really been any key characters. So this may sound kind of weird, but like as Bethany was talking about, you know, having a prominent Hispanic as like kind of a lead character or a lead male character. But it's not just that for me. It's the fact that, you know, sometimes with Hispanic people, our names don't necessarily come across that we're Hispanic. Okay. Yeah. Jimmy Smith was in the prequel trilogies, but that was a pretty uh, not Hispanic name. (laughs) Yes. And and that's what I'm talking about. I mean, it's hard. Yes, you're of that particular ethnic group, but your name may not actually sound like you are. You know, or a lot of people see me and they think that I'm just American Indian, which I am. I am part Apache, but, you know, a lot of people go there rather than going the Hispanic route. So I just, I don't know. I was like, yes, your name's Diego Luna. I don't know. <laughs> it was like this big Hispanic pride thing. One of the things I I learned just sitting and signing books at Celebration was there is a huge following of Star Wars in Latin America. And I wasn't that it was surprising. It's just that maybe because you're, you know, you think about it, it's, Star Wars has been very focused on America and you see a lot of stuff out of obviously London because that's in Great Britain because that's where it's being filmed, but just a huge, amazing following and they have conventions down there. So mm-hmm. there's a big untapped market. And I, you know, I, when I was in Costa Rica a few years ago, that was the one thing that the guy talked to me about was the Clone Wars that he, they had it on TV. That was the one cartoon that his kids watched. So this, it's, you know, we forget the Star Wars is big outside of America. So obviously they're going to Japan. So they're going over to the Asian market. We're seeing a lot of, of diverse actors and actresses coming in to Star Wars. So it, I, I like that it's opening up to being a global franchise. We think everybody knows Star Wars travel around the world and it's not as recognizable as it is maybe to us in our lives. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited that diversity is, is everywhere and it's permeating Star Wars as well. So um let's actually, I'm kind of interested because Star Wars weekends, weekend number one just happened. And Trisha, you were there. I was there I, and there was just fans of every kind. Disney World <laughs> is the place for that. If you're going to have one Disney park where you've got extreme diversity, Orlando would be it. Yeah. Now, what I really want to know, though, um, what was your favorite drink and which glowy item was your favorite? I have one of each so of course of course i would expect nothing less <laughs> if anybody watched my instagram and twitter feed i was taste testing and um trying them out along with uh amy Ratcliffe. Mm-hmm. so i don't know if i have a favorite the endor tastes very much like punch and the dagobah is very tasty as well and they will mix you can like play like disney infinities and they will mix <laughs> and match your glowies oh good but I sort of had this moment when I'm drinking the Alderaan and it has the Death Star glowy in it. And I was wearing my X-Wing um, rogue <laughs> dress. So I I tweeted something about having a very meta moment it, in that the drinks were very popular and not just because they were hot, but they, they were very good. But one of my favorites was not in the kind of the booth roundup. It was in the Rebel Hangar, which was the Rebel Red. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that one had an X-Wing in it. Ugh. And you could only get that in the Rebel Hangar, which is essentially part of the, what is that? The um, Backlot Express yes. Diner is now half of it is they've sort of set tables. They put little centerpieces or um, figures from the larger action figures. Oh. I don't know. How big are those? Oh, they're over a foot tall. So there was like a cane in one and there was a couple of spaceships on different tables. And then the menu was fun. So I had the dark fried, which was chicken nuggets and waffles with barbecue sauce, which was delicious. And I was sitting outside and the Jedi training Academy was going on, which is that can't be any more awesome. And then trading with the Jawas, which Teresa, I believe taught me about doing. So, (laughs) so there's a glowy Falcon, a glowy X-wing and a glowy death star, right? Yes. That yes. Anything that glows to your heart's desire. Trisha, you also just did a book tour. I mean, you are a busy, busy, busy girl. What was the book tour like? I have to I have to say I have no complaints. There was one day where Adam Bray and I were in temp. That was May the 4th, actually, where we 
literally started going to show, you know, do morning shows at 7.15 and ended our book signing at 9.30 night. But that was probably the most awesome. Uh, that bookstore was amazing in Tempe, Arizona, which is just outside Phoenix. And we had a huge ex- escort of 501st members and they stood out on for the whole time. They sold every book in the store of Ultimate Star Wars, which was it was something like 60 copies, plus they had pre-sales, plus they had post-sales, so we were signing book plates. And then there was uh, the um, the Force Awakens trooper. There was one of the uh, Novos, uh, guys who worked with the Novos to get it done for celebration. And I have to... I have to marvel at that these guys from the Fiber First are so good at selfies because someone's like, can I take a picture? And they're like, no, we're fine. They just stick their head, <laughs> <laughs> their heads in. And so that, and every place I went, there were so many kids. There were so many fangirls. There were, I had a string of guys who were getting their books signed for their girlfriends. Oh, so, oh nice. And their wives. So I was like, oh, who's this for? And I look up and he's like, oh, it's for Claire. And then, you know, the next one, I'm like, what? on they're like yeah you know so (laughs) it's like it's not for you and they're like no our wives wanted it or our girlfriend wanted I'm like this is awesome so I felt just so much love and excitement and every bookstore is unique and it's just really important that these bookstores are there keeping people reading and I got to hang out with Jawa James in San Diego and also Mediocre Jedi so that was fun yeah so you know people by their Twitter handles yeah. And I know I was I was excited to see you again, Trisha, so soon after uh celebration, because Richard and I headed down to Carlsbad, California to see you and Adam Bray. So that was really cool. Just outside of Legoland, too. And I got to go to the Death Star, see the Death Star at Legoland. And that was really fun. But apparently I missed out because I didn't go on the elevators at the Legoland Hotel and get to disco dance. I did not know that happened. You have to come back. It was an amazing opportunity and then just to go around the country and meet Star Wars fans. So I was really just, it was so much fun. I'm tired, <laughs> but I will be, I will be signing for three. I have three more dates and they're all at Star Wars weekends number three. But one of the things that I got to talk about a lot and I brought it up was Star Wars in the classroom. And I, re- I think I recruited 20 teachers during the tour to Star Wars in the classroom. But Teresa's kind of kind of been up to, you know, she teaches and you've what you've kind of bringing some more people to the geekdom. So I've always worked really closely with a small group of students. Um, but this year with what I'm doing teaching, I don't have a small group of students anymore. I just have the kids that are in my classes that I teach. And so I realized something was missing and I looked around and I said, you know what? We need a geek club and we have some other clubs focused on anime and some other things, but I wanted like an overarching geek club. So the club is called Geek Force. It is in full swing now. It has been approved and all that stuff. We actually had a meeting today before we recorded Um, and it's starting kind of slow right now because we're getting towards the end of the school year. So it's not a great time to be starting things, but I wanted to kind of get our feet wet. And actually the club decided our next meeting is next week. We are going to be watching A New Hope. And so we're going to watch it and then we're going to discuss it and kind of pick it apart. The goal of the club for me, like the dream for me is to be able to build this community for these kids because we know that a lot of kids in their high school years, you know, they're bullied or teased or whatever for liking the things that they like. And maybe not as much because geek culture is sort of popular right now, but what happens when it's not, you know, and and it'll get there eventually. Everything goes in cycles. But the dream for me is to have the star football player that loves comic book characters and movies and stuff will be able to interact with the extremely awesome, you know, kid that does computer graphics and can design video games. And they would never cross paths ever except for in Geek Force. And that's kind of the dream is to be able to build that community for these for these kids. One of the big things is they want to do is for like movie release Fridays, being able to go as the club to the movie theater and go together um, instead of having to, you know, maybe they go by themselves or maybe they never go and get to see, 
you know, a movie because they don't have anybody else that will go with them. So it's kind of trying to build all that. But more than that, um, they're really interested in starting a website so that they can do their own blogging and write reviews of movies and books and comics. And um, they've even thrown out the idea of maybe starting their own podcast. Wow. I think that's a great, great way to get kids ready for the real world, you know, because in regular classrooms, you know, you have math, you have history. It's like, how how does this apply to the real world? But with this club, you're actually applying what you learn in real life. So I I think that's wonderful, Teresa. I really like the aspect of it where, you know, you talk about having sort of a, a community for them, a community that, you know, a lot of kids might not have outside of clubs like that and I, I think that's that's particularly cool yeah today we actually talked about the words nerd and geek and we talked about how the different words make them feel and the things that they associate with those two words and how we can kind of work together to change the stigma their homework was actually between today and our next meeting is for them to experience something in geek culture that they've never watched before so mm. I have a student who loves Star Trek but he's kind of narrow minded towards Star Wars. So I challenged him to open his mind and maybe, you know, watch something and think of it differently. And we had a whole list of stuff on the board. I mean, it was like three columns deep. I think that's wonderful. Actually, Teresa, I was thinking of you today because I was getting my drive through order as young, uh, you know, there's high school students working there and I had my little pony. What is the purple one? <laughs> Twilight? Twilight. Yeah. So my purple pony that's sitting <laughs> up on my dash and he's like, I like your twi- is it Twilight Sparkle? Yes, Twilight yeah, that- Sparkle. Yeah, I like your t- I like your Twilight Sparkle, and I'm like, you rock. <laughs> <laughs> he had to have been, but he was a high school kid, and he knew that I like the pony because he's purple, and I like horses, obviously. So that's why he's on my dashboard. But I was like, this is so awesome. So you know that he was like, yeah, just saying it. So you know, wear your geekdom proudly. And one of the things I've found from these kids is that I actually have quite a few seniors that are attending my meetings and these guys are getting ready to graduate, you know, oh, girls, because they're actually girls. Um, and a lot of the majority of my group is, has been, and the interest is actually girls. So, you know, I had a couple of seniors today that were saying to me, you know, that they're really bummed that this started now and not <laughs> when they were, you know, still going to be at school. You know, so it, that was an encouraging, encouraging thing for them to say, because you know that they would be there and that they're sad. So, Sarah, you like you tire me out, dude. You do <laughs> so much stuff and then you decide, oh, you know, I just I just do all this other stuff, but I'm going to go run a 10K. Um, <laughs> you don't With know. wings, no less. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you do that, but. Tell us a little bit about the Tinkerbell Half Marathon and anything you saw that was Star Wars-y. Yeah, I, I did the Pixie Dust Challenge, which is run a 10K on Saturday, and then on Sunday morning, you run the half marathon. So it's like 19.3 miles in all. The Really, the only thing I saw Star Wars was actually my uh, half marathon running costume, which I finally made a running version of my Jedi Tink, and complete with new Run Disney New Balance Tinkerbell shoes that glow in the dark. And these are shoes that I never knew that that I absolutely needed until I actually saw them. And what was funny is they didn't really promote the whole part that they glow in the dark. So I posted on one of my Tinkerbell half marathon groups on Facebook, a picture of them actually glowing in the dark. And now, and then there was like hundreds of comments and like 300 people liking it. And they were all going, Oh my gosh, now I need these. Oh crap. Now I need them. You know, like <laughs> people who weren't going to buy them were like, well, now I need them. So I think I made Disney a lot of money that weekend. <laughs> I took a picture with Tinkerbell as Jedi Tink, and I think she's a Star Wars fan because she commented so much on my outfit. She's like, I love it. I love it. So just have you know, Tinkerbell is a Star Wars fan. <laughs> I met Tiana one time oh. wearing my Ventress hoodie, and she was like, ooh, you're Ventress. And I was like, eee! Isn't that fun when, when they recognize that kind of thing? It's like kind of out of their wheelhouse. But <laughs> actually, Jack Sparrow did not know who I was. 
I mean, I think he knew, but he was staying in character, you know? So he's like, oh, you little pixie, what is that, a sword? You know, it was funny. <laughs> uh, I think people are saving their Star Wars costumes for the actual Star Wars half marathon in January of next year. And that tends to sell out really quick. So if you're thinking of signing up, the signups for that are June 16th. And uh, yeah, just make sure you're on the ball with that if you want to go, because the inaugural Star Wars Half Marathon sold out all three races in less than two hours. One day, I will eventually do a run Disney event. I'm not ready for that right now. So I have a hard time going up three flights of stairs at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm lazy. I will just come out and say it. Trisha, we're lazy, aren't we? <laughs> I'm not a runner. That's we are sure. not runners wonder, right now. <laughs> I'm going to be in the cheering section. That's how Yay. I want to do a run Disney event. <laughs> you know what? If you do volunteer, you get a free one-day ticket to Disneyland. We've been talking about Star Wars. We always talk about Star Wars. But sometimes we don't talk about some of those things that sort of come up in the world that maybe we discuss on Twitter with some of our friends. And one of the things that has come up every now and then, but we haven't really talked about it a lot, is the state of Star Wars and where it is now versus where it was when it was under the George Lucas regime. On this particular episode, we wanted to kind of dive into this and about our thoughts on whether or not Star Wars is better off without George Lucas. Trisha, um, you've been around Star Wars probably the longest out of the four of us. I mean that, and I mean that in a very positive way. <laughs> They're going to retire me out to pasture with George Lucas soon. <laughs> I will not have $4 billion when I go, though. Um, but you've been around it the longest, and it's been something that's been in your life for forever. How do you view it? As a fan and then also as a journalist, you know, the difference between Star Wars being with George Lucas versus how it is now. There wouldn't be Star Wars without George Lucas. And he so he had a vision. He went against what everybody in Hollywood said you should do. He had an idea and he made it happen because he has a singular focus to do things and he's very determined. He actually has a very good sense of storytelling too. And sometimes it can be a little bit scary when storytellers go off on different tangents and you're like, Oh, I'm afraid because I don't know what you're doing. I don't think George Lucas, you can't have Star Wars without George Lucas. It's just like you, I have sometimes have had a difficult relationship with my mother at times in life, but I wouldn't be the person I was without my mother. In part of my fandom, and I talked about this on the blog, I've, I've talked about this many times, is that I felt that he was very focused on doing the things that he wanted to do. And sometimes he would leave his name on books and comics and not necessarily oversee what was happening with them. And I think he allowed things to just be Star Wars, to have a license on them. And that's actually been discussed in the commentary recently, it was brought up by Kathleen Kennedy that the Star Wars is moving from becoming had what had become a licensing company back to being a film company, to be a storytelling company. And at some point, Star Wars, it, when you sell something at such a volume, you actually at some point give you, you're, you're making an exchange of your idea, your story for actually money. He he made money. And so it becomes part of the community. And that was one of the ideas that Star Wars really set, thought that, you know, that one person cannot rule the the sort of the galaxy. And that was what the rebellion was about. So I almost think he, eventually what was going to happen. So I, I don't think that George Lucas ruined my childhood or ruined anything in in life. I think you can't like Star Wars and not appreciate what he did as a visionary. So how's that? It's a, in the long run, eventually Star Wars had to leap off of its singular vision and go the way it was going. Right. And I like what you said there. You know, of course, Star Wars would not be Star Wars without George Lucas. I mean, it wouldn't exist. But I guess, Sarah, you know, I can take this another way. Do you feel like Star Wars is better off now without George Lucas? Because, you know, as Trisha was saying, it was almost kind of like he was the emperor. And now it's mm -hmm. almost like we're being we're in a government where everybody gets a vote and gets a say. So how do you do you think Star Wars is better off now? 
I think I would have to say yes, because as you said, George Lucas kind of became the emperor that he was, you know, he was, he was the rebel back in the seventies. And then he became this huge corporation conglomerate. And so now, so now fans are actually making the films now. So like JJ Abrams has been called the first, uh, you know, the force awakens is kind of called the first fan film that with a huge budget, obviously. So I, I, I think that makes star Wars itself more accessible to everyone because you are a fan. The fans are creating what, what you love and, and it just becomes this vast community of people uh, that are, that are all have this, not a singular vision, but they, they all love the same thing. And it becomes like Star Wars Celebration becomes, you know, like everyone gets together. You all love the same thing. You all have something to talk about in the long run. It's it's definitely a good thing because obviously George Lucas can't live forever. And so the fact that Disney has taken the helm and they kind of have the same vision that George does and Lucasfilm does, it, it all works together to create something that will last um, forever. I tend to agree with you that you know, things have to move in a different direction and that now we've got fans that are creating Star Wars. So, Bethany, you know, you've been involved with the fandom world for quite a while um, with the Star Wars report and things like that. Do you feel like the fandom is growing with this change from, you know, from Lucas over to Disney and if it's changing in a positive way? I do feel it's changing in a positive way, but I don't actually really feel that it's because Lucas is stepping back. This would have happened no matter what person you had at the helm of Star Wars. In a way, it's like if somebody had tried to, well, let's use Stan Lee as an example. Let's say that he was a bit younger and he had rights to all the characters and everything. He was like, well, I will make every single Marvel film myself and direct it myself. Well, that would be impossible. It would be (laughs) completely impossible for one person or even like just two people to direct all of the Marvel films that are currently coming out. So in the sense that I think that star Wars, like, like the Marvel films, star Wars is now a lot better off not having one person who is kind of directing everything. And I think that we can actually in some ways thank George for that because George picked the people who would be, taking the, you know, he chose who he handed off the baton to. And I think we're beginning to see the very positive results of that because seeing is the evolution of the franchise in a much better way and in a better direction, uh, but not, not through, not because, oh, George is gone now, so it's fine. I think George actually directed some of this, you know, to him it was his time to take a step back. But that also, I think he had the vision to see that others could run with Star Wars in a way that one person, no matter who you are, can. It's not just so much the fact that it's, you know, what one person can do. Each of us and each of us on this particular panel, we all have different views and we have different thoughts. And I'm not going to think the same way that you do, Trisha, or Trisha, you're not going to think the same way that Bethany does. Having more hands, you know, or more minds to come up with things, I think we have things now that George himself probably never could have dreamed would happen. Um, I think that, you know, he definitely saw the film side of it, and I think he definitely saw the toy side of it and saw, like, oh, you know, we can do all these different things. But he may not have had the tools in his wheelhouse or whatever to be able to create some of the stuff that we have now. You know, we wouldn't have what we have with Lego without Lego, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes those kind of minds to build that world. You know, I think now Star Wars is being given the opportunity to grow and evolve and change and have a lot of things that appeal to different people. And I think one of the places we're seeing that is going to be with a film like The Force Awakens, which I feel like is going to be very Star Warsy, versus a film like Rogue One, which I have a feeling is going to be very more like your action-packed war-type film. And feel free, anybody, to chime in here, but how do you guys feel about the kind of content that we're getting and do you like where star Wars is going? That's a stupid question, but you know, do you, (laughs) I mean, I know we all like it, 
but kind of deeper than that, do you feel like it's going in a positive direction? Y'all Beth, get what no, I Beth, mean. <laughs> Beth if he actually hit it on the head when she said that he picked the right successor at the right time. Probably the Clone Wars and working with Dave Filoni and that crew helped him mm. sort of let it go, right? Because you, you, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Music. I, we did I did that. Let it go. Kennedy was the right person. She's managed huge blockbusters. She understands all the pieces that have to go into the puzzle of making a movie, a big movie. This is a big, huge movie. And then dealing with corporations and executives and people talking money and licensing. And it probably, it happened, all happened a little slower than they thought it would because they sort of had to grasp what really Star Wars was. And even Disney, you know, Bob Iger talked about in this interview on StarWars.com they did at Celebration that he they didn't even know what they bought. Like they didn't know that he could describe Star Wars as a religion. And I think that's an apt descri- description in that there are people who live and breathe this, that, that it is uh, it means very much to them in an emotional level. So yeah. you have to kind of understand that. And Kathleen Kennedy has done amazing things and even looking at the celebration and understanding not just kind of the Star Wars fan that Lucasfilm had begun to cater to, but realizing that Star Wars was indeed a cultural phenomenon that's way bigger than even Lucasfilm had thought it was. And this is very important that he picked the right people because it could have gone into what we're seeing right now with DC, which is very much not driven. It's driven by a couple people who want to make what they want to make and aren't trying to access what a wider audience would be be able to accept be accessible to them. Sarah, do you feel like the fans are actually being listened to by the Star Wars community versus maybe other franchises that are out there? Yes, I definitely do. In fact, I believe Richard and I, I think we were talking with Adam Bray, Trisha, um, and he was saying how Star Trek, uh, back in 2000 or something like that, the Star Trek fans were, were trying to make fan films and doing things like that. And the s- people in charge of Star Trek at Paramount were stifling them. They were like, no, no, sending NDAs and all this, all this stuff. And, and so the fan community was stifled. Whereas Lucasfilm did the exact opposite with Star Wars fans. And now look at this. I mean, we have Star Wars Celebration. We have fans who are, you know, tweeting with Freddie Prince Jr. and, and, uh, you know, it's just very accessible actors and players and uh, in the Star Wars community. So I, definitely Star Wars is listening covering Disney they they're already good at understanding that you sort of have to build things from if your fans don't like something if your grassroots fans don't like something they're not going to tell everybody else to go see it so you we need to have people saying oh I'm really excited about this and talk about it and say you know there's a movie there it's weird because you can go to a book signing and people be like well, I think there's a movie coming out at some point. This is literally the conversation I had. There's people who are Star Wars fans who came to a book signing to get a Star Wars book who were like, I think there's a movie coming. So, you know, in our minds, we know, we know, I think it's, I don't know, it's a little over 200 days at this point, but we know, (laughs) we know how close it is. And it's almost like, I can't believe, you know, it's going to be at the end of this year. But there are people who are just Star Wars, who are Star Wars fans who are marginally aware that there's a movie coming. Mm. It's hard to grasp because we're so in it. But really, we're not the the normal fans, no, the average no. fan. We're um, yeah, <laughs> we're not normal. We've known that for a while. Right. Well, I want to bring up a little a little sidebar here. Being in the media and going to some Disney events. What what Disney does and why I think Star Wars is in good hands is that for each movie that Disney puts out, they will invite 25 bloggers to a special press junket in which basically a group of bloggers will get to speak one-on-one with two of the actors or two of the producers or two of the writers from a film that they're trying to promote. I did this for Big Hero 6. And through that and writing up the blog post for this, you got to actually learn a lot more about the movie, about the inner workings of the film. And, and you got to promote that online and more people would learn about 
you know, how, what went on into making this film. And so Disney knows that having, you know, the small bloggers on their side or, or just small listening to the people that I think they know that that really helps promote a film. Somebody, I don't know who said it, that, you know, that Disney or that Star Wars being with Disney is that they're in good hands. And I think that's true because I think we'll see a lot of things in Star Wars we might never have seen before because Disney is what I like to call ballsy. They do, <laughs> they do all kinds of stuff. I mean, even back in the 70s and the late 60s when they switched over from doing traditional hand-painted cell animation to doing Xerox animation, I mean, they did it to cut costs, but they also got a brand new look of films. And in the 2000s, they switched over to doing things like Stitch and the Emperor's New Groove, like Leo and Stitch and stuff, completely different. And then having, you know, people like um, Tim Burton coming in and working on some of their films and continuing to use him in a live-action Dumbo, for crying out loud, that's going to be coming out. <laughs> I want to see how they make an elephant fly but you know i mean it's just they've gone with a company that i truly feel is going to bring a whole look a whole new look a whole new feel to star wars and in a really good way so maybe instead of our original question of saying is star wars better off without lucas maybe the question should be you know did george lucas basically i don't know what the right question would be but you guys did understand he, what i'm trying to say did like, he hand, yeah did he hand it off did he make the right decision to go with disney absolutely I think so. yeah well and on top of this it's it's more like kathleen kennedy is the watcher of star wars now she's the, the keeper of star wars uh she's the librarian if you will <laughs> <laughs> but uh to me, it's she has the knowledge of what Star Wars is at its heart and how not to lose that. You know, she knows George Lucas and his vision and she she knows Spielberg and she knows that traditional filmmaking and those traditional classic themes. Uh, and I, I feel like she she has the the knowledge of that, but also a lot of competence. I mean, will you say a woman who is competent competent in the world of filmmaking i mean kennedy would be the one you would name immediately well, and uh, she also she also knows george lucas's weaknesses at having yes. produced him over the years so she probably knew where she needed to sort of shore up the franchise Definitely. yeah so like where disney may not have really understood star wars necessarily getting it, get it getting it they have kathleen for that and kathleen has Disney, with the the power of Disney and its money, you know, they're not afraid to experiment a bit to kind of push the edges of the box to see what might be new and cool and interesting, like Teresa was saying. So I feel like that's a a match made in movie making heaven. Thanks, guys, for being willing to go down that rabbit hole with me, because it was just something I was thinking about, and I really thought that it would make a good discussion. Sophia Hunt wrote this email, and when we all read it, we all got warm fuzzies. She says, Hello, I'm Sophia Hunt, and I went to celebration with my sister and my parents. And it was just so cool getting to go to the Fangirls Going Rogue panel. Getting to hang out with you guys was absolutely one of mine and my sister Cheney's highlights from celebration. I just thought it was so cool on the latest podcast, listening to audio from the panel and getting to relive it. Also, it meant so much to us to get to talk and interact with you guys. It was so awesome getting to flag down Sarah before she left so Chaney could give her a drawing and saying hi to Trisha, even if it was quick, and getting to chat with Teresa. We also just want to say thank you to Teresa for posting the pics of us with Vanessa and Tia on the Fangirls Going Rogue Facebook page. May the force be with you, and we hope to see you guys again soon. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> Sophia and Chaney, like, I love these two girls. I I got a lot longer time to chat with them than you did, Trisha, at our panel. And um, I know we all got drawings, and I got Ahsoka as a My Little Pony, um, oh. which is, is, I am crazy about. But, yeah, they came to Vanessa, Marshall, and Tia Sarkar's signings on Sunday, and I took pictures of them getting their stuff signed and posted on the Facebook page for them so that they could see it, because those are those memories you don't get, you know, when you're, when you're doing something and all you can remember is what you saw, you mm-hmm. know, but you don't get to see yourself doing it. So, um, you know, right. I wanted to make sure I took those for them. So now I have names with the beautiful artwork and because I went through all my stuff and I was putting it all out and the those things like you cherish that 
stuff. So we appreciate you writing in and telling us about it, Sophie and Cheney. And I think probably we'll see uh, them in Star Wars' future as artists because, wow, good stuff. Yeah, really good. Just keep going. Keep going and <laughs> shoot for the stars. So we are very fortunate to have somebody with us um, straight from Star Wars Weekends. And it would be... Sabine herself, the lovely Tia Sirkar. And we've been trying to have her on the show for forever, so we're excited we finally get to talk to her. So let's jump into talking to Tia. Fangirls Going Rogue has had you on their list for our wish list, so I can't believe it's been this it's taken this long. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. We're we're excited because one of my favorite characters. Sabine. Oh, I'm so, so glad. Thank you. Of course, because she has pink, so <laughs> have my pink on. So you came to Star Wars weekends last year. I did. Did it prepare you for celebration? No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I I don't know. I mean, for me, that was my first time at Disney World, mm-hmm. and to come to Disney World in that you know in that capacity was just like incredible and so for me personally I feel like my experience with the, with the Star Wars weekend was the most sort of like like welcome to the family like this is how it's gonna be it was just overwhelming but in a wonderful incredible way and just to get to like meet and and at that point you know no one had seen a second of the show so I didn't know what to expect I didn't know what how people were even if people even would know who we were and would wonder why we were here and yet people were so excited and encouraging and um supportive and people had like drawn pictures of sabine and had like sabine stuff already it was i mean it blew my mind i I was so overwhelmed with like uh you know their encouragement and enthusiasm have you had time to digest anaheim and the what happened? Do you have a favorite event? Or? Yeah, I do. That that panel. I mean, I nothing could have prepared me for that. I had, I had no expectations because I didn't. I'd never been. I didn't know really how it went. And um, we were sort of in the green room before our panel, getting ready. And somebody came in and said, "Well, there's four thousand people out there waiting for you." And I laughed because I thought he was kidding, or I didn't even know what he was talking about. And he said, "No, there are four thousand people in this like arena type." like stadium kind of uh, uh, auditorium and and they're waiting for you guys and I thought I I couldn't even really process that but then to get to watch the trailer with those 4,000 like excited you know fans um, and none of us had seen the trailer either so I got to see it with everyone on that huge screen with that incredible sound system and that was like so such a memorable experience. I don't think I'll forget that. That's how we knew you were fans because you all climbed down on the floor on the stage. It was an amazing. And you were like, you know, ready to watch it. I'm so glad that I hadn't seen it before because, you know, I probably would have watched it on like my computer versus that amazing screen and it was great. And then to get to hear the fans' reaction to Rex was like priceless. Priceless. <laughs> and you had had you so like none of the animation you obviously recorded it, but you didn't know what to expect. So. I'd I'd not seen old Rex. Yeah. And I had yeah, I hadn't seen old Hondo either. I mean I knew I knew obviously that they what was happening, but I hadn't seen them in action. That was so awesome. And how about Rex's like awesome moving I had I we saw like a mock up because you know when there's like a new character or or an old character coming back um, or like a new kind of contraption or animal or something creature they show us um, what it looks like but not animated obviously right. it hasn't been animated yet so I I was so curious to see what that looked like it was so cool I can't wait to see those episodes it, that that just blew my mind it's it, I just seen Howl's Moving Castle so yeah, yeah so it had that real, yeah yeah that really cool vibe so. They talk a lot about that Star Wars uh, actors are a lot of times cast to type, that they sort of are what they are. And I've noticed that online you're you're like an activist. You, you speak up. <laughs> I do. Speak up for what you believe in, which I love. Oh, I'm guilty, like, yeah. guilty. <laughs> Why do you feel it's important that you speak up about things? You know, I love a good food pick of my breakfast as much as the rest of them, but I feel like if you have a platform and you do feel strongly about things, which I really, really do, for better or for worse, I think, you know, it's, you know, 
there's only so many selfies one person can take and post, you know what I mean? So I think, I, I feel like that social media is a place that you can have those conversations and we don't all have to agree and we don't all have to like, you know, I don't only want people to follow me because they share my like socio-political views um, and I, I welcome like, you know, healthy discussion and debate, not like, you know, antagonistic people saying like, oh, you know, such and such. But I try to keep it productive and not, yeah, you know. positive. Yeah, yeah but, positive. but I think it's, I think that's kind of like what we can use social media for is to like discuss these issues and talk about, well, I also sort of like post things about, you know, I care a lot about like, um, environmental issues and things of that nature. So I just want to like be able to use that platform to bring light to causes that I feel passionate about or discuss issues that I think that, you know, are worth discussing in like a bigger, bigger way. I don't know. My mom was always like, be careful, be careful what you say. And I'm like, well, you know, if I get in trouble, I get in trouble. But at least if it's something I care about, I, I want to talk about well, it. Well, And in that way, Sabine's got that same sort of energy where she wants to, we saw that a little in the episode with her and Hera, and yeah. she wanted to kind of, you know, yeah. she wants to do something, yeah. get something she, done. She, she, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm honored that you even, like, drew, drew that likeness, because I think <laughs> Sabine is so much cooler than I am. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, yeah, she, she feels passionate about the causes. She, you know, she really is a very passionate, strong-willed person, and, um, and she wants to do something about it. She wants to take action, and I, I so I, I admire that about her. Obviously, you're not acting any way. You're you're going to be animated. But do you feel any because she has the the bucket on, so to speak, that you need to bring more to her voice when you're acting? You know, it's funny. Um, that all happens after the fact. Like I don't. I I I act uh, the way I would as if I live you know like on camera pretty much because that's the only way to do it if you if you think like oh no one's gonna see me you kind of you you'll be able to hear that in your voice so we really are acting those scenes you know for the most part in in that room together I mean not physically like doing all the battle stuff but we are really like like acting and and then they just um do that effect with the mic or with you know like my calm uh after the fact so oh, no okay. I, I don't I don't even most of the time I don't even know when I'm like, I'm not even paying attention to whether she's got the, the helmet on or not, because it's all the same for me. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that was, I, I always wonder, because you don't know if, that, yeah. if they say, okay, this is going to be something with your helmet on. No, or... no, and in fact, yeah, it's immaterial, because I'm still doing the same thing, and then sometimes, because I also don't know how it's animated, so I don't know if she's got the helmet on or not, so they just, like, deal with that after the fact. There Are there any times when they're just, like, asking you to make funny noises, like you're in a fight or yes. something, and you're like, oh, oh my gosh. I will say Taylor has it the worst. He has, somehow, Taylor always has, like, the majority of the, like, okay, grunt, and then now you're falling, and then you've hit something, and then you're kicking somebody, and then someone kicks you in the, like, elbow. What does that sound like? I mean, poor Taylor has to do the lion's share of that stuff. But, yes, we all have, um, it's called Walla. I'm sure you know that, yeah. And so we have lots of crate. And, and early on, they wanted us to do a Walla library, so they just have them on hand if they need, like, a punch or a, <laughs> someone's like falling from a short distance now falling from a long distance so we sort of had to go through and do this whole library of sounds and different like volume and level of like okay you're getting electrocuted a little bit and now you're getting electrocuted <laughs> a lot man um i'll tell you who's really excellent at that as if you couldn't guess is steve bloom he can just make any sound at the drop of a hat like anything you could possibly think of. You're getting impaled, and he knows exactly how that sounds. Him and Deep Breath. Like, oh, gosh, don't even. There. Yeah, oh, de- yeah. To get, to get to see those guys in the room doing all of these voices is just, like, awe-inspiring. It is truly, like, a magnificent thing. Have they thing. taught you anything specifically, I mean, Steve? I'm trying to just soak up as much as I can. I mean, and hello, Vanessa. Like, she's, all everyone, and even, like, our, like, um, guests, guest actors that come and do like an episode or two everyone is so amazingly talented I'm constantly just trying to soak up as much information and and like tips and tricks and and things as I can because it's just like a constant flow of like uber talented people well Sabine was one of our favorite characters from the beginning just because obviously there was a mando uh, a girl mando Mando with pink no less and we got to see like a little bit of her, but I feel like 
even though we don't see a lot of her, that there's a story. And yeah. is there anything, because you can't really talk about what's going to happen, but is there anything you've discovered about Sabine? Yes. So I, um, I agree. Well, actually, James Arnold Taylor's daughter just came and said, I really love Sabine. She's very mysterious. Yes. <laughs> and I thought that's, that's excellent. Yeah. But you she feel is. like it, the mystery has something. Right. Yeah. And it does. And, and so I know a little bit and what I know is super juicy and awesome and it really informs the character and like what's happened in her past to get her to where she is and to being a part of this, this rebel crew and why she is so sort of anti-empire. Oh yeah. Um, uh, yeah, like, like violently so, you know, like, like really, um, emphatically against the empire. And so, um, I know a little bit, I can't wait to get to really flesh that yeah. story out because I think it's going to be really fun and also kind of deep, you know, it's not just surface stuff. Um, but I will, I can maybe say that in season two, we definitely do get to kind of start seeing a little bit of Sabine's past and maybe some people from Sabine's past awesome. perhaps. Awesome. That's what we were waiting for. I don't for. know if I can say that's that, but our, I just did. That's all right. That's what we were waiting for. Um, obviously, Sabine's a style icon oh, as a Mandalorian, yeah. and you have your own unique style. So what, what do you, we talk about, you know, your fangirl flair and even, you know, even when we're talking, they have a lot of guy listeners too. Like, what's your advice for just making your own, being your own fan, being your own style? Because it, I think you you seem to just own it. Oh, you... thank you. I I really like it when people just go for a, a unique, you know, aesthetic. Like, I think uh, it's fun, and it, I think, you know, being, I try to keep, oh, I try to not be cookie cutter, you know what I mean? Like, I, I try to, like, sort of go with what I, go with my gut and really have fun with, uh, clothes and accessories and, Yeah, I um, know, you're rocking the leopard print. <laughs> I got the whole thing going on. Vintage <laughs> X-Wing Star Wars. Yeah. I love it. Um, especially with Star Wars, yes. there's so much out there that yeah. you can really, like, play and, 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 you know, cut up a t-shirt or cut some sleeves off of this thing and, you know what I mean? So I just really like to, I think, I love it when people's personalities shine through their, 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 their wardrobe, their accessories. You've got these amazing Sabine shoes on right now that I'm totally envious of. Yeah, I love that. Talk to Dave about that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I got, I got to um, And then lastly, we, you got to say that you've been enjoying Star Wars with your mom. You, oh, yeah. Yeah, so, and... Obviously, celebration. We saw a lot of family. Yeah. So, um, is, what is it? What is it has made it special? Enjoying it with your mom. Well, I have to tell you, like, so my parents. People ask, like, were you a Star Wars kid? And I can't say I like was, you know, like Freddy. Like, grew up playing Jedi and all that, <laughs> which I'm, I'm sort of envious of because I, I would have loved to know about Star Wars from a, a young age. But I, I just didn't because I don't think my parents really knew. I mean, they just. I wasn't, I, my dad was making me watch like Cary Grant movies, you know, when I was a kid, so, which I love as well, but, um, so I just didn't, I didn't come to Star Wars as like at that age, um, but now, so my mom is like the biggest Rebels fan, she watches every week and then she calls me after the episode, she wants to talk about like what's happened, what she thinks is going to happen in next week, you know, next week's episode, what she thinks should happen, <laughs> she's got all kinds of opinions, but it's great because she, she's like, she made me realize that it's like a testament to how great Star Wars really is, is that anyone from any age, any background can come to Star Wars at any point in their lives and really legitimately become a fan. And um, I think that's just really wonderful and makes it special. Like, you know, you can enjoy Star Wars at any point, not having been a Star Wars fan before. So I think the same applies for me. I, you know, I'm a full-fledged fan now. Um, but it's so much fun to get to, like, talk about Rebels with my mom. She calls me and we're like discussing what we think should happen season three. You know what I mean? Like forecasting. So it's been really... And, and you, you know who to let her call when she's, oh, yeah. when she's oh, yeah. not happy. No, she's with literally, thing. I shouldn't even say this, but she's literally been like, you should tell Dave, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. that's not going to happen. <laughs> I would like to keep my job. I'm not about to tell Dave what he should do with the show. <laughs> but I appreciate your enthusiasm. I love it. Well, Tia, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank I you. I hope you get to enjoy the rest of your time I here. can't imagine that I will. It's yeah. so much fun. 
the heat is brutal, but you know what? It's just, it's like, who cares about the heat when you're having a good you're time? You're having a good time. Yeah. You don't notice it. It's All so right. glad, it's so great to finally talk to you, yes. too. Thank you. Thanks for having we me appreciate on. it. Now we just want to watch Rebels, right? We yeah, want season we two. want to watch Rebels like all day long. <laughs> oh, yeah. We want to watch Rebels. You know what? I, it's something I have to say. I don't think that uh, you ladies might know this, but I so dragged my feet when it came to Rebels. I remember Teresa, the first Star Wars thing I went to. Yeah, you you know, because I was I was telling you about it. But, like, I was just like, I missed the Clone Wars, and I didn't want to like Rebels, and I was just like, give me the Clone Wars <laughs> so What did I back. tell you? I told you, and you Bethany, were like, you'll love Wars it, Bethany. Over. The Clone Wars is over. It's time to move on. You're going to love it. Just deal with it. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I probably put on my pouty face and <laughs> yes, shut did. up for you a little did. while. <laughs> like, but I, 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 I did it. So I watched, like, the first episode of Rebels, and I was like, oh, yeah, that was cool. I miss the Clone Wars. I miss the Clone Wars. I just want the Clone Wars back. Er. So I was I was a complete and total like Grinch for the entire first half of Rebels, and I'm not sure what made it click, but it finally clicked, and I love the show, and the actors are so <laughs> cool and amazing. And Teresa, I should just listen to you more often. Yeah, well, I'm your big sister, and I'm usually right. <laughs> yeah, you are. Shout it out, shout it out to the social media from Teresa and Trisha and Sarah. Shout it out, shout it out, fangirl shout outs. We have from Jedi RG on Twitter, that's Richard Garrett Jr., he tweeted out a picture of a Leia figure with holding a lightsaber. And he said, Jedi Leia, courtesy of my son. He loves his female figures exactly the same as his male figures. So I loved that turn on, you know, there's so many female fans wanting female characters, but here's here's a, a son who just decided, you know what? I'm going to make a Jedi out of Leia, and this is the other side of it. So I think that's so cool. I yeah. love it. Yeah, I, I didn't see this until a day later, but Chica Fence dad was wearing a Fangirls Going Rogue shirt, and he took a picture with the chip walks at Star Wars Weekends. And he tweeted it to us, and it was said, just for you guys. So it was awesome. He chose the black shirt, and so the Fangirls Going Rogue logo really stood out, and it was amazing. And those shirts are available on tpublic.com. Essentially, our shout-outs that ended up getting our giveaways, the last two from the podcast stage, which was the uh, Fangirl Fell Ring from Amy Ratcliffe, and also the copy of Ultima Star Wars, signed by me, Trisha Barr. And, wow, that was kind of weird. It's sitting in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I still have these, mo- like, have these moments where I'm like, yeah, I should do it. Anyway, <laughs> the winner of the Fangirl Flare created by Amy that we uh, were was part of the people who were at the podcast stage is Jedi Ravenwood, who tweeted an awesome picture of us at the panel. And Amy actually picked the number from all the people who po- tweeted and shared, shared on social media from our panel. So hopefully Jedi Ravenwood does a blog for cosplay. She'll enjoy this little piece of flair. And then the second item we had to give away was the ultimate Star Wars copy signed by me and that is admiral underscore rex on twitter so if you guys could both email us at fangirls going rogue we will get that stuff out to you as soon as possible in the mail so you get to enjoy them and we have for this month's giveaway a second ring created by amy for anybody who is listening and also we got rebel earrings from think geek (gasps) can i win those <laughs> no, <there's> no. <laughs> <Stop it. laughs> hey, no, I'm so, not technically a host. That's right. I'm technically a host. So you so, can do this from all your accounts, but all you have to do is tweet, I want to fangirl flail with fangirls going rogue, which is at FG going rogue, and you will be in the running for one of those items. Woohoo! Yeah, make sure to hashtag fangirl flail. I want to thank, thank Think Geek for donating that piece. They also sent uh, the Her Universe Dual Suns shirt, which is awesome for yoga. And then I got on my own their Death Star Maxi. Have you guys seen the Death Star Maxi on Think Geek? 
I know. Yeah, and I was sort of like, uh, I don't know. And so I wore that at Star Wars Weekend, and just like I, literally five people just were like, that dress rocks. So if you were up in the air on Death Star Maxi, apparently it gets the thumbs up from random people that just come up to you and tell you that. And this wasn't even, I was actually over walking around Epcot, so it wasn't even Star Wars weekend side of the Disney that people were liking it. Awesome. I'm sold. <laughs> I know. It's not hard to get us to buy stuff. No. So I was, I was totally peer pressured. <laughs> They're into BB-8. Yep. <laughs> dress. Yeah, I totally spent $100 that I wasn't gonna plan on spending because I was peer pressured. Thank you, Trisha. I'm about to go down the rabbit hole with Pandora and the Think Geek charms that actually fit on a Pandora bracelet. Um, mm, yeah. I have my fingers, arms, legs crossed for an anniversary present of a Pandora bracelet so I can put Star Wars charms on it. So, <laughs> woo! <Woo-hoo. laughs> yeah, and they have dangly, dangly earrings too. Did you see those? The, the Death Star, the X Wing, or a Tie Fighter? And I think it would be really cool if they glowed. But then you'd have to put them in a drink. Apparently, if <laughs> <laughs> Sidious, Anakin, Luke and Leia, Qui Gon Jinn, Co Bibble, Kylo Ren, Salacious Crumb, Bib Fortuna, Boba Fett, Amadala Wick. R2-D2 BB-8, I can barely keep it straight. It's a character discussion. It's the fangirls on character. It's a character discussion. So when I was talking or thinking about character discussions, I was like, you know, what have we done? We've done bounty hunters. We've done Ewoks. We've done Falcons. We've done, you know, Han Solo and Luke, those people. But what we haven't talked about are our fangirl crushes. So instead of doing one specific character, we each have prepared, well, or maybe have prepared, um, a couple of uh, of our Star Wars fangirl crushes. So I'll start um, with the first one that I can think of, and that's actually going to be Kanan, <laughs> believe it or not. It has nothing to do with the fact that he's voiced by Freddie Prince Jr., okay? It's nothing <laughs> to do with nothing. that. nothing. Maybe a little bit. Um but no, like, Kanan's just a really cool dude. I mean... He is. And, like, he's so suave, too. I know, there's just so something funny. about Kanan. There's, there's, he's, like, he's kind of funny, but he's also kind of mysterious, you know, so he's got a little bit of that bad boy in him, you know, yeah. but you know that deep down he's a good guy, you know, and it's just kind of like, ah. Well, he's, he's wounded, don't we all go after the wounded one? <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes, yes. That Well, I, I'm really part of the character discussion is to talk about wh- what we, like, what attracts us to characters, too. Mm, yeah. Oh, well, then Which, this is perfect. Everything. Other than, yeah. <laughs> the way <laughs> he looks. Everything. But it, it helps that, you know, he maybe needs, he needs somebody to take care of him a little bit. Because you don't necessarily think of jedi in that way but i mean he had a rough go of it and is everybody reading the canon comics because i love them yes. not yet i would oh. be, i'll be hera any day <laughs> you saw did you see i tweeted the the canon and hera flags are flying next to each other at star wars weekend so i tweeted it at um and just put hashtag space married to freddie prince jr and vanessa marshall that's awesome <laughs> i couldn't resist <laughs> That's funny. So, um, like, Kanan, he is, there's a depth to his character, too. You know, it's sometimes, you know, you you mentioned we might go for the sort of wounded character. But I think because in in ways, all of us have something in our past or something difficult that we've dealt with. So we can we can empathize with a character who is or has really struggled with something. So there's more depth to the character, more believability in that. Absolutely. Sarah, what's your what's one of your crushes? Well, those of you who know me might be able to guess. Now, there are some of you who go for the wounded characters that you can fix, like possibly Kanan. But then there's those of us who go for the cocky alpha male characters. That would be me. And so Han Solo would be my number one. And I know a lot of people on our Facebook page also chose Han Solo. I like the sound of that. Yeah, but Han Solo is just, he pretends to be the alpha male because every time Leia tells him to do something, he's like, okay. (laughs) That's true. The only time he got a one-up on her was when she says, I love you, and he said, I know. Oh, my gosh. Guys, okay, 
So I have to tell you about this total sidebar of this, but it it kind of applies. So you know the I love you, I know thing? Yes. Well, mm-hmm. Sarah, if you were still playing Top's digital Star Wars card trader, mm-hmm. um, they have these quotes cards, and they came out this weekend with an I love you Leia card on Saturday and an I know card with Han on it on Sunday. And if you got both, oh, nice. black and white, and the like sepia versions, mm-hmm. you got a pink award card. Of the I love you, I know cards. Aww. Aww. I didn't do it. It was too hard. It was the, the odds were ridiculous. But you could have. Bethany, what's you what's a, a first crush? You, you Definitely Han. Is like for me when I saw Star the Star Wars films, like for I love the character of Luke and he's probably one of my favorite Star Wars characters. But at the same time, I always looked at Luke like the person who would be your best friend or would be your brother. And so, like, like for me, there was never really a crush factor there. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, that was that was always Han, just because he was cool and cheeky and cute and, you know, all, all these things. <laughs> you know, you, you get to have the, the fangirl crush on somebody that you're not entirely sure you actually would date in real life. <laughs> So you would drive you insane. That's all right. They, well, that he's it, probably like Hansel would be the guy that you wouldn't bring home to your mother. Like he's got <laughs> right. a bounty on his head. Like the cops are after him, or the or the not even the cops, the bad guys are after. Him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't bring Hansel home to my mom, but you know, but that's sometimes that uh, makes them appealing. But he's he had a heart of gold, so. Absolutely. If you guys saw the Facebook post where I posed the question, I'm giving I gave away my first crush and we don't even know Can I anything. Say it? Can I say it? <laughs> I know who it yes. is. Yes. Who? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I love the way you said that. It doesn't sound quite as cool when you don't say his last name. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Po Dameron. <laughs> there you go. That was better. But I mean, and, if you I, say Po, it's like, like, Po. I don't you know. Draw it out, like Po. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and listen, he's okay. So he's, a, but I'm, I'm being shallow, but I'm not. All he had to say <laughs> was, that, was that he was the best freaking pilot in the galaxy. He's the best freaking pilot in the galaxy. That's what he means. <laughs> And that did it for me because it's, well, people know I love, because Han Solo already said that. So, you know, I love the corner Han- you're painting yourself in. Earth girls are easy. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, it's the, it says it all. He thinks he's the best and he believes he's the best. And that's all you need to do. So he's essentially, I think he's maverick. He's mm-hmm. maverick of, of top gun. The first, uh, yes, he's Top Gun, right? Uh-huh. Which is like, one of the. Did you see that picture of him? And I mean, I know you did. I'm saying this hypothetically. Did you see that picture of him <laughs> in Vanity Fair, like just standing there with the X-wing and looking oh, off into the distance with the brooding look and the brooding gray clouds behind him? And yeah, yes, he's like the yes. Betsy. Yes, and so. <laughs> I'm, but the, so in that way, he reminds me sort of the spirit of Jag Fell, who believed he was the best also. So I have this kind of affinity for the cocky pilot character. So it, it, and I, I sort of think that just, I don't know. I just feel like he's going to be really awesome. So I have a crush on him already. And sometimes that's part of the process with new movies is just sort of falling in love with the idea of something and then seeing where they go with it. That's a great point. I mean, I don't know if we're all going to go for a second one, but I have to. Uh, you have to. I have to. I've changed it several times, by the way. Um, I've been thinking about <laughs> she it. She has. I'm looking at her notes. I'm like, well, we'll see where, where she's at when we get back to her second one. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is where I'm at. I don't care that he's a Zabrak, and I don't care that he's had spider legs and I don't care that he got chopped in half but Darth Maul has a very special part of my heart and there's something about his voice and about the way he looks and about his fighting style and just about you know his maulness 
He's definitely wounded. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Sorry, I had to go there. Because that was not her choice before, so we weren't. I was not setting this up. But now that she did Darth Maul, I totally had to go there. So. Awesome. I mean, there's just something, and you know what? Another big part of probably what the Darth Maulness is is, well, I mean, Ray Park. I mean, have you guys not yeah. seen the man yeah. or heard him talk? Yeah. Because. Um, yeah. Well, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, he he brought that character to life, too, right? It could have been just sort of a bad guy that they fought. Well, right. But, I mean, but then we get the amazingly adorable Sam Witwer, who does his voice. I mean, they just keep amping up the sexy. Yeah. Well, and they get all these nice guys. I know. know. Like, they're, you know, harnessing. And that was, Teresa, actually, James Luceno said that in your Star Wars Bookworms interview about the, um, it's easier to do the bad guy than the hero, so type thing. So I, that's totally where my brain went. Because they're not bad guys in their own mind. Well, they get it all out of their system. I don't know. I mean, they're just, they're great underneath. You just gotta, you just gotta barrel through, you know? We're seeing more of Teresa's true dark nature. Seriously. We already know. We know this already. So, okay, so Han Solo, Sarah, and then there's got to be a second. Yeah, for me, I would go with the young Obi-Wan Kenobi as played by Ewan McGregor because I don't think anyone can resist that grin. Yeah. Or the way he says speciality. Sith Lords are our speciality. (laughs) It's good stuff. Uh, I, I, I think even if we had guys on this show, they'd be smiling like, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to go with an untraditional and lesser known character just for the heck of it. That is Karth Onassi from the Knights of the Old Republic. Mm. That was nice. That is a nice choice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's a pilot, so a bit like Poe. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, I have to say it that way from now on. <laughs> and he is a, a war hero of the Republic and a soldier and Darth Revan's companion in the game. And he is also very cute and handsome <laughs> and loyal. And like he, he's extremely loyal. He's cautious. So like he's a lot of, he reminds me of Han Solo in some ways because, you know, you've got the, this sort of dashing pilot thing going on, but he's a lot more tried and true. You know, when we first meet Han, he's definitely a bit of a, like he's a pistol and you're not quite sure if it's going to blow up in your face or fire where you aim it, you know? Hmm. I like that. The pilot. I, I have to, I have to just add this in because I, it, it didn't really, and Teresa probably has a better appreciation of how much, how much fit Harry Potter fans love Domhnall Gleeson. Uh-huh. But uh-huh. when I was at the, at the, yeah, so the <laughs> book signing, the, the young ladies who were working at the one bookstore, like that was all they wanted to talk about. Well, what is he playing? And I'm like, we literally have no idea. I can't and, wait to find out. I'll tell you that yeah, right but, now. That's all they talk yeah. about. So I have a better appreciation that, that there are people, who, you know, are people who are actually interested in a character simply because they, from somewhere else that they've seen them. And apparently he is uh, the one because they were doing this little shorthand. Oh, he's the one. He's the one. Which one is he? Which one is he, Teresa? Don't Which one is he in Harry, in Harry Potter? Yeah, because they they were mm-hmm. explaining it. I know. I'm totally I'm totally adding myself. I don't watch yeah. the movies. I don't he's remember. Bill, he's, he's Bill. Yeah. He's she the one explaining. that um, he's the one that gets attacked by Greyback, the werewolf, and he turns into a werewolf and he marries um, Laura Delacour. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh! See, so that's essentially the conversation they had, and I was just like, mm-hmm, that's "Well, and Domhnall yeah. Gleeson <laughs> is the son of the actor who plays Mad Eye Moody, so that was pretty cool." And well, anyway, totally not on topic. So I'm I'm totally going on a on a different fangirl crush, and you know, sometimes we do, you guys didn't go out there, which you typically do, but this is mine is Asaj Ventress. Excellent. Ooh, nice. I was going to ask you if you guys had a girl crush, who it was going to be, because mine's Padme, but you did it before me. She's my girl crush. She's she's my girl crush. And she's wounded and definitely a bad girl. So, but I I think she rocks. She rocks the outfit. She she just rocks, like, everything. And she, I don't know. I just, I'm fascinated by her character. I'm more fascinated that 
somebody sort of gravitated to her, which was Katie Lucas, and managed to really bring her from somebody who was just there to sort of, you know, be a foil and made her into a really interesting complex character who had an arc. And it's, you know, it proves that not every time the characters don't necessarily have to be the good guys to root for them and that the female characters can be all different types of characters and still be interesting. So she she's definitely one of my fangirl crushes. Come and get me, boys. Yeah, I would say if we had to pick a girl crush, my girl crush is between Padme and Ayla Secura. So it's kind of like everybody wants to be blue. (laughs) So I think we we and then we always want you guys to tell us who your fangirl or fanboy crushes. So if you guys have one, then, you know, let us know and we have it out there and send us an email, tweet us, tell us who it is. (laughs) Would you get going, you pirate? I'm sad because it's time to say goodbye to all our company. (laughs) M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E. Anyway, um... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but um, let's go ahead and tell everybody where they can find us. So you guys can find us on Twitter. We are all over Twitter. Bethany, you are at Bethany L. Blanton on Twitter. Indeed I am. And, in- and Instagram. Um, the mm-hmm. show is at FG Going Rogue. I am at Ice Cold Penguin. Trisha is at Fangirl Cantina. And Sarah is at Jedi Tink. You can email us at fangirlsgoingrogue at gmail.com. Facebook, just type fangirlsgoingrogue. And Tumblr, it's fangirlsgoingrogue.tumblr.com. And on Instagram, we are at fggoingrogue. And so far, Sandra Shoot has done an awesome job of Instagramming photos we send to her and everything. So it's, it's awesome. She's taken over the Instagram account, and we love it. And voicemail, you can send us voicemail, 331 331- Two one Ewoks, which is also three three one two one three nine six five seven. And please go to Rebel Force Radio on iTunes and leave a positive review. And in your review, mention how much you love fangirls going rogue. And now, Bethany, we had loved having you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, and it's a lot of fun to be on the same show as you, Sarah. I think this is a first for us. Yeah, that's awesome. So I'm excited. And until next time, everyone. Da 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 da. Yub yub. <laughs> <laughs>